Hi, everyone. I apologize for being late. But you got to check it out now. So go to the City of Ansonia Facebook uh, site. They've got it on. They know you can. Did they get the mango pineapple? <laughs> Anybody ever get some fruited iced tea at Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Here we are, Derby Woodbridge <laughs> Town Hall. What do you want to talk about? Well, I certainly can start. Why don't we start with the, uh, the budget? That was Go ahead. The bipartisan uh, budget. Uh, so as you know, uh, the session ended on uh, May 9th, and our biggest task was to actually uh, come up with a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. right? We had a bit of a deficit we had to make up for uh, the, the current uh, fiscal year, and also we had to make up some for the second fiscal year, which begins July 1st and ends uh, in 2019 on June 30th. Um, we were fortunate enough to actually come up with a budget that had overwhelming bipartisan approval. As you know, uh, Malloy said he wasn't crazy about the budget, but he knew that we had the votes to override any veto, so he assigned it to law. So I was uh, greatly in favor of the budget, the bipartisan budget that passed. And why? The main reason why I'm so in favor of it is because it doesn't include any new taxes, which is what I've been screaming for. So we were able, we were able to pass a budget, balanced budget, that doesn't include any new taxes, and it doesn't contain any tolls. I was oh, not in favor oh. of the toll, so we managed to do that uh, to do that as well. But, I mean, just the gentleman said for now, but we only do budgets in a biennium, so right. But you know, we, we have, have an election year coming up. Well, we didn't have any new taxes last year either because of the budget we pushed forward. So, and that wasn't an election year. So, all we can do is fight this fight every year, mm -hmm. um, and that's our job to do it every year. And we have to take that fight every year. We've taken it every year. Um, that we've been there, so you're right for now. But next year's another year, right. That's right. and I'm sure we'll fight the fight again next year. Right. But this budget, right, exactly, doesn't include new taxes. It does not. And that's a that's a that's a positive. That's going and the Medicare in the Medicare savings right. program and and the ECS, the school funding, we were able to keep that intact, as well. intact too, which were two important things right. in the Republican budget. And insurance, Husky A, as well, we're able to keep that uh, funded as well, which I think is, is great. Uh, preserve grants for substance abuse treatment and mental health care, very important. Fully funding uh, aid to the disabled, uh, we actually added 1.4 million. You know, so again, kind of all we've been talking about, it is, there is, it is possible to balance the budget, not raise taxes, as long as you look at and prioritize where you're spending uh, your money. You know, not balance the budget on the backs of our seniors, or our, our most vulnerable residents, that being our children and those individuals with uh, developmental and, and intellectual uh, disabilities. We managed to, to do that, and that was our goal for this uh, assessment, for many of the legislators, uh, and we were able to do that. So uh, very, uh, again, very happy uh, about that. You know, I just, I think I just want to add to that. Um, as you all know, we've had very big deficits in the past few years. And I know that it's been our priority for many years, but I think it's brought to the fore the, the notion that, particularly with such limited amount of funds that we have to use, we have to make sure we use them very wisely. And I think it has made a lot of people uh, listen to what we have been saying for years, that what is really the role of government? And I think we've really focused in the past few years on the fact that we need to help the people who need our help the most and allow people who can maybe do things on their own to help them, to enable them to do things on their own so they can help themselves. But that's what we have focused so much on, whether the Medicare Savings Program, or we put a lot of focus into intellectually and developmentally disabled population in the past few years and, and worked very, very closely with a lot of the parents groups throughout the state. <coughs> because there's so many parents, um, it's not only children, but the bigger issue now is, is adults. Mm -hmm. So you have adults raising adults that can't that can't take care of themselves and then the problem is you're getting people to the point where they're old enough and they're they're you know they're passing away and they're really worried about what's going to happen to their children who are now adult children um, deep into their adulthood so we we've, we've we've sat down and we focused a lot on who needs our help the most and that's what we've been able to and I've been you know, as proud as I am of, of the ta ta not raising taxes and, and stopping tolls, and I, and I want to discuss tolls also in a minute on a separate note, but 
It's really about when you run for office, especially on the state level, what you think your job is. You know, and I, and I really think it's to help as many people as we can who really need our help. And that's where you have to prioritize those dollars, particularly when you have such, so few right now. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, well said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and other programs like Care for Kids, for example, we were able to manage to keep that uh, intact as well, which I think is, uh, uh, is great. Um, veterans, uh, we restored $2 million to fully staff the state's veteran hospitals critical care unit, also very important. So that's in the, uh, uh, in the budget. Uh, fully funding, this is a, a big deal for you know, all of our you know, communities. Uh, the fiscal year 2019 uh, education cost sharing grants. Try to make sure that the state is providing uh, the accurate amount of uh, funding or what sort of what we kind of promised or pledged that we would. Uh, and made it uh, much more difficult for the governor uh, to retract that or to change that as well in this budget. I think it's also a good, uh, a good success. And what you saw this year, which was the craziest year since I've been there, you've seen a lot of, um, last September we passed a Republican budget in the legislature. And as you know, we, we don't, there's a tie in the Senate with Republicans and Democrats and there's a small majority in the House of Democrats and we got our budget passed which we were proud of not because it's supposed to, you know who wins and who loses but what we believe back to the what the priorities of the state should be but what that did was not about okay it's a Republican budget it's a Democrat budget but we believed it was a very responsible budget but the governor vetoed it and there wasn't the will in the legislature to override it. but what it did is it forced the Democrats to come to the table and and negotiate with a, as I like to say, a reasonable mindset. And by that I mean this. Last June, you're supposed to put a budget out in the Appropriations Committee by the end of April. That's the deadline. This is the first year in the 20 years I've been there that there's, there was not any budget that came out of the Appropriations Committee in the end of April, May, June, July, August, September. A budget was run, a Democrat budget was run in September, but it didn't have the votes to pass. So they kind of just did it as a pro forma thing. They, they called it, they ran it on a voice vote, and then we called our budget and it passed. But the budget they were talking about calling had anything from sales tax increases to surcharges on your, on your cell phone, just because you have one, okay? A, tax, a surcharge tax on your cell phone, surcharge tax on second homes, and that's not just, that's not just wealthy people who have two homes, it's if you buy a, you know, buy, say, a little a home or a little apartment to fix it up and try and sell, you know, use it as additional income, any of that kind of stuff. Restaurant tax, just be, so you have your sales tax and you have an additional restaurant tax. I mean, there was one thing after the next. Um, that was, those were part of the budgets that they were trying to pass, but they couldn't even get the votes on their own side to pass that. So it forced them to sit down with us, which we did, leaders, for six torturous weeks, at the end of September, and I mean torturous, like no, most of us can't even go in the room that we had the meetings in. Um, and we, seriously, there's no windows in it or anything. It was like a prison. And, um, and come out with a budget that passed on October 30th or 31st in a bipartisan way, but not just in a bipartisan way, but in a way that the governor could not override it. And it was the first time in my whole career that we, were, we negotiated budgets, not for 76, which is a simple majority in the House, or 19, which is a simple majority in the Senate, but for 101, you know, and for 24 in the Senate, which are, they, you can't veto, they're veto-proof. The governor, if he vetoes them, we override them. And that's a Herculean task to make sure, I mean, to get that many people, especially when the numbers are so even. So we were really proud of what happened in that budget because there were um, bonding caps and spending caps and volatility caps and mandatory votes on union contracts, you know, which, which are common sense things. I mean, you, you want to vote for the union contract, vote for it. But we should at least vote on it. I mean, you elect us to go and vote on things, and we should explain why we voted yes or no. Um, so there were decades of, of fiscally responsible concepts that we've been fighting for for years that were in that budget. But that will show you that's what happens when, when there's not one party in large control of any government. It was more even and that means there were more moderate ideas and more reasonable, you know, reasonable planning and, and budget writing to get done. We also had, um, the Senator and I are on public health together, we also had two, two bills that came out of public health, the Whiting Forensic, regulation of Whiting Forensic Hospital 
and the sober living homes, having them um, the ability to register them in, in your town and on the, with the state. So What's a sober living, <coughs> living home? Once you come out of rehab facility and, and you're clean, it's a living facility, an apartment complex or a home that houses like-minded people that are recovering. So it's almost like a halfway house. Right, so but it's not a halfway house. But not, it's, it's not a sober it, house? Sober, sober living home. home. Sober oh, living sober home. Sober home. So it's not, yeah. you don't get, they're not state services, but you're getting, it's a clean house, house living facility. They have Narcan on the premises. We just, the, the point of the legislation was to keep flop houses from coming. So say we're a sober living home and getting 20 people living in two apartments. And not regulating them coming into your town and not knowing what's going on or who's in there or who's in control. So now these they have to be registered with it, the Department of um, Public Health and Demas, Mental Health and Addiction Services. So because we want it to be regulated more. So first of all, we want to make sure they're being run the right way. Right. But secondly, we wanted people to know so you could just go on the, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services website, website and see okay. Here's one in my area, or I have a relative that lives here. So there's you know, some accountability for these owners, for the landlords, that they're, like I said, not, not because we have issues with just people opening them up and having flop houses. There's no control, there's no regulation, and people are getting hurt. So if you register them, the town can stop it from opening up? No, you can't, you can't. You register with Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and then they will you know, go on their website. So there's some oversight on it. So if you're right. having an issue, they'll either say, okay, they were registered on there, or if you're coming out of a rehab facility, you could go onto the website and see these are the places that registered with the state. Right. But you have to be certified by the state. You can't just say, I'm gonna, my, my home is all of a sudden a sober home. It's gotta be certified with whatever the certification process is. And they have on, you can do, they also will do on-site inspections of these facilities to make sure that they're running properly. Well, associate. So another uh, area, which I'm proud and happy about, uh, this uh, budget fully funds the special transportation fund, uh, resulting in surpluses in the fund in each of the next uh, five years. So the special transportation fund, you know, money has been put into those funds over the uh, years. It's been raided a, a number of uh, times, even recently, at least in a big way, in the last several years, at least a couple times. Uh, so now the special transportation fund is fully uh, funded. Hopefully that will help to get us back on the right track in terms of trying to start to catch up on our infrastructure uh, needs for our roads uh, and bridges. Uh, again, I just think it's important that we, you know, we're focusing on that. We're able to do that in this budget without raising taxes or, in the meantime, uh, installing any uh, tolls. Uh, I have yeah. no idea we're going to tell about tolls. We're going to chat about tolls in a, in a little bit. I, uh, I, for example, I wasn't in favor of uh, any of the bills that I've seen that was really study tolls and, uh, and install tolls. You know, I come from an engineering background. You do a feasibility analysis. You take a look at an issue and potential alternative analysis. Then you decide. You stop. You decide, does this make sense or should we stop now or do we need to go a certain direction or path? Uh, but to just have a bill to just study tolls and install them, to me, didn't make uh, any sense without giving uh, people uh, the information, uh, how many tolls, where are they going to go, how much is it going to cost the average family, uh, that sort of thing. So the bills that were floating around this past session regarding tolls, I was not uh, uh, in favor for that reason. Uh, oftentimes, I found that folks were, uh, that were in favor of tolls uh, were thinking that someone else was going to pay tolls, to <laughs> pay the tolls like out-of-state drivers. And as soon as I point out to them, no, 75% of the revenue from tolls is going to come from uh, folks living in uh, Connecticut because we, won't, we can't achieve the revenue numbers by just charging out-of-state drivers. For example, uh, truckers or, uh, the uh, trucking industry is already paying Connecticut for utilizing our roads. There's a compact in between uh, New York and Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island. So all those uh, tractor trailers that are using our roads on a regular basis are already uh, paying the uh, state. Uh, so when you take a look at just those drivers driving through, in order for us to get the revenue, it was $600 million, $700 million, $800 million a year, uh, we would be looking at a rates of about uh, anywhere between the uh, low end, 10 cents per highway mile to 20 cents. So you just do the math. Now, how many miles do you drive on Route 8 or the Merritt Parkway uh, or any of the, uh, the interstates? Uh, and now to go from here to, you know, to Hartford, you're going to pay. To go from here to maybe the Milford Mall or Trumbull uh, Mall, you're going to have to pay. If 
you have to drive to drive to work and pay a toll. Okay, that's fine. Three, four, five dollars a day. All right. What if your spouse drives to work? Now you just doubled it. What if you're like me when my daughter just received her driver's license three weeks ago? She goes Back to school into his car. to Trumbull <laughs> and, and, and drives to, to Trumbull. So now she's gonna, we're gonna have to pay for her to go back and forth. It adds up quick. And I just thought that uh, uh, residents of Connecticut are just gonna literally lose their minds if we install tolls and they actually realize what it was going to uh, cost them. So I wasn't in favor of tolls as it was presented to me uh, now. Uh, and I, I feel that if once uh, if residents you know, knew the details and the impact of all the information, okay, this is what's being proposed. This is what it's likely going to cost you. Are you still in favor of having going from no tolls to having tolls on every major, uh, you know, highway, uh, road in, uh, in in Connecticut? And I I was confident that the answer would be a resounding no. Right to possibly 50 to 75 tolling well, entries yeah. across every major highway. I mean, here here's <clears> the thing. I I, I, I saw a complete turnaround in, in people in the state because I go all over the state from last May to this May in regards to their feelings about tolls and here's why. Because we made sure that everybody was educated and informed about it because there was a lot of misinformation. And just to give you a, a few of the facts, George already has, but I just want to explain it in a way that, that made me understand it better. I am not one of those people that says under no circumstances, there's no scenario in this world that I would support tolls. I'm just not one of those people because the tolls of today are not the tolls of 30 years ago. They're much safer. They're much quicker. I, I get it. We've all been through states that have different tolls that, that are, you know, they don't jam up and, and the whole thing. Here's my problem. Connecticut is the third smallest state in the country and they were recommending. Now, George was talking about these proposals. Not only were there four or five proposals this year, but there were four or five proposals last year. And they all ranged from 50 tolls, tolling stations, to like 85 in the third smallest state in the country and everybody talks well in New York they work and in Massachusetts they work there's like three roads that are told and Connecticut and New York and Massachusetts are much bigger than we are just for some perspective from New York City to Niagara Falls is approximately 418 miles I think and if you go that distance on their road you pay almost $20 in tolls in Connecticut one of their proposals had you going from Greenwich to New Haven, which is 40 miles. All right, so 10% of that and paying almost $10. Okay, that's just to put it in perspective what some of these other states have versus are. So you can't even compare the two because they're not at all close in, in how they did it. And they were originally people thought they were border tolls. Well, that's illegal. The federal government does not allow us to do border tolls. Okay, it's just, it's not our decision. It's the feds, and it's been like that forever as far as transportation funding we get or don't get with border tolls. Um, so then, then people thought it was you know, just on 95. Okay, 95, 91, Merritt Parkway, Route 8, Route 9, Route 2, uh, you know, any other road you can think of, 84, every road. So basically you go out to get a gallon of milk and there would be likely a toll somewhere along that way. Um, so what I found interesting this year is about two months ago, whether it was DOT or whoever came out with it, they suggested this idea that you could have a special pass if you were a citizen. Oh, right. And then 70% of the people in state would be paying. Because, you know, people have the perspective, well, all these people come through the state of Connecticut, and they don't have to pay anything. Well, that makes sense. Except to George's point, trucks and everybody else already pay separately. They're not going to pay more. It's just going to be, you know, part of their, what they pay. And then they come up with this idea, well, then you can have a separate one if you live in Connecticut, so you'll pay less. Well, here's what's interesting, and this is all you really need to know. They've been at this for several years trying to get tolls passed, and this is the first time they came up with that idea two months ago. And you know why? Because they were trying to pull the wool over your eyes and make you think that it was something it wasn't. You want to come before us with a realistic, fair proposal, or the first one to sit there and listen to it. But none of these things that I put before you are realistic to anybody that hears about them. And it was important to make sure we got this information out. And that's why they didn't pass again for the second year. They want to come up, you, you don't do a piecemeal. And you want to know why there wasn't a realistic proposal? Because they have been so irresponsible with their budgeting for so long, they just want to get money. So they're like, let me figure out how to get the money first and then we'll see if it works later. I mean, we've had enough of that, let's, let's do it and then we can fix it later. You don't fix anything later. 
Nothing gets fixed. I mean, as Lowell White, you're about the income tax, right? We'll just do it now to get some money, and then we'll see. What, you know, then we'll get rid. You don't get rid of taxes. You don't get rid of anything. You better get it right the first time. And if you have to tweak it, that's one thing. But you don't substantively change it unless a new technology comes out. You know, that's that makes things work better. But it's not just oh, you just don't like tolls. I mean, there's real reasons why, and there's more than one of them. So. And more to come on that, because I'm sure the. Oh, much more to come. Will, much will more to come. Back to the. We're going to keep that fight up until <laughs> until we continue and there's to. There's no offset. Is my is my property tax on my motor vehicle? Which oh, is, of course which, not. Is, no. which is just a usury tax. That's why I drive a 12 year old truck. I'll be mm -hmm. damned that I'm going to buy a new vehicle in this, and register it in the state of Connecticut and look at a seven or eight hundred dollar property tax bill. I don't blame you. I'm not going to do it. So. You're going to pay tolls, but you're going to take away anything? Of course not. Not in this state. They and even if you did, it would on. still be neutral. Right? You're not paying less. Right. Well, right. it would so, actually so, go up because the town right. will start crying because they haven't lost the revenue and some, they'll raise your right, property But if for some reason right you could say your property taxes are going to be lower because but it still wouldn't, I mean, you're not going to pay any less. So it's, you know, it's just not raising it. Yeah. Some other areas of interest in the uh, budget there. Uh, maintains, uh, the budget that was just passed, maintains new retiree tax breaks contained in last year's bipartisan budget for pension and social security income. Um, this budget rejects the governor's uh, proposal to eliminate the $200 property tax credit, which supports elderly and working families. Um, also, let's see, preserves grants for substance abuse treatment and uh, mental health care, we chatted about. Um, uh, fund, fully funds uh, old age assistance with an additional 1.8 million. There's a bunch of services for old age assistance, so we were actually able to uh, shore up that fund by 1.8 uh, million dollars. Again, keeping the focus on our seniors, our children, and those folks that are most vulnerable uh, in, our, uh, in our society. Um, uh, restores uh, uh, full funding for municipal aid, $28.4 million more than appropriated in fiscal year 2019 as originally enacted, and $70.5 million more in municipal aid than <coughs> fiscal year 2018. So our municipalities are screaming uh, that their uh, you know, funding keeps, keeps getting cut, there's issues of uh, repercussions from that. We're able to provide uh, better funding to the municipalities and still not the budgets, and still not uh, uh, raise tax, so I think that's a, a win. So uh, many of our municipalities are much more, are much happier uh, for that as well, because they were looking at uh, some massive and devastating uh, cuts on a municipal level to services. Uh, you know, so I don't agree with the governor in terms of um, not uh, reducing at the state level, if you will, uh, certain services and that sort of thing, but then cutting at the municipal level. Because we're all still we're all still affected by it. You know, if you cut at the municipal, so the governor says, "Hey, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't uh, raise the income tax, I didn't raise this this uh, sales tax, but and I didn't do anything to change my, you know, horrible spending habits. But I'm going to slash the municipalities and have them fend for themselves, which really means that's us, that's you and I. Uh, so I'm I'm glad that this bipartisan budget did not take that tact, did not take that route, and looked at it in a more, more holistic uh, right. basis. But the, but the bigger problem with that is, listen, we all recognize in this fiscal situation we have people, things are going to get cut, and people have to figure out a way to do more with less. We do it privately, we have to do it government-wise. So that's not the biggest issue. The biggest problem with the governor this year was that we do a two-year biennium budget. So we do it like last June, technically, although it didn't get done until October. And that goes for two years. First of all, we do our budget too late. Because as you guys know, towns and cities end up doing their budgets in April and May. So towns and cities have to figure out, okay, this is what I'm getting from the state before I figure out what I can do in the town. And, and you end up doing it blindly because you're kind of guessing, particularly last year when it was such a mess. So we have put, pushed forth legislation year after year to force us to do our budgets, the state budget, in April. Okay, and the, which never passes, but that's something we, we feel strongly about. Secondly, once it's passed and a town and a city is relying on that money, 
You can't pull the rug out from under in midstream. In the next year, if you want to then say, well, we have to cut you here, we have to cut you there, that's one thing, because the town can plan for it. That is the biggest complaint, and I get it, from towns and cities. Don't cut us in the middle once we did our budget. I can't do anything about it. And so that's what the governor did more than one time last year. He did it with, um, with the town aid. He did it with, um, what was it? Was it, it wasn't town aid road. It was, it was bonding for municipal projects. So say there was a project that a town had to put half a million dollars in and the, and the state was going to give you half a million. So it was a million dollar project. You knew what you were getting and so you knew what you had to put in and you budgeted for that. And halfway through, in January, the governor goes, yes, sorry, I'm going to cancel all those. So now what do you have? Half a project up? You know, you, you need another half a million dollars? I mean, that's the stuff. And that was just him being spiteful, because that's how he is. And that's, that's serious stuff. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. You cannot pull the rug out from people in midstream. So that was why we, in this budget, we passed uh, the no holdback provision saying you can't hold back money in, mid, in the middle of the fiscal year. You want to do it in the next, the next budget when the towns know what they're getting? That's one thing. But don't do it after everybody's budget in every town. <coughs> and most towns budget better than the state does and more responsibly. And so then, you know, we're, we're messing with you guys. So that was, I think, you know, philosophically and practically speaking, the, the biggest reason for that. And that's something we've been trying to do for years, way before our time. Do you guys have any questions? We don't want to just sit here and blab away. Prognostic. So, Go ahead. So in uh, this budget, did you guys make any progress with funding the pension plans that were unfunded? We actually, we actually did. When the budget that we put forth uh, two months ago, we did a third, a third, and a third plan. So. You probably heard back in January, there, they called it a windfall of all the, the budget surplus. Uh, we got almost a billion dollars in. But that wasn't, that wasn't income tax and sales tax, all that kind of thing. That was repatriated money that pe pe basically, I mean, to oversimplify, people that had their money offshore, we gave them 10 years, 10 years ago to say, you got 10 years to bring it back here, so we're, you know, we're getting the taxes from it. And so, of course, everybody waited to the end of the 10th year to do it and so we got all this money it was but it was it was a one-time thing so we decided to take so that with a couple extra hundred thousand dollars that was in there take a third of that and fund state pension so just put you know a lump sum in to just at least kickstart that and a third to fund the teachers pension and then a third to put in the rainy day fund um, and that was that was the proposal we put forward in regards to that that was not the proposal that the Democrats agreed to but that was something we felt very strongly about. Right, right. So in the budget that passed, right, we provide uh, so like $16 million to the retired teachers yeah. health care fund. So there's two things. There's a teacher's pension fund, and then there's the, te the retired teacher's health care fund. And I think it's uh, the $16 million was 33%, That's correct. That's right. which is full them, them being fully funded. So we've, we fully funded their teacher's retirement at that point, which was the teacher's point. retirement. Medical. Medical. Yeah. It's now healthcare. Healthcare is now fully right. funded. Yeah. Which we're getting, at least I was getting a, a lot of uh, interaction in terms of calls and, and emails uh, on right. that issue. So we better we're able to take care of uh, the care of that. Yes, sir. Okay, so there's two things in here about um, clean energy programs. In one of them, it looks like you want the, um, the uh, power companies to purchase credits. I'm not sure, quite sure from whom, but and in another one, you're requiring them to have a certain percentage of their. Um, this is page nine of seventeen. No, thanks for that. Um, you're requiring them to have a certain amount of renewable energy in their portfolio. So, um, I, how how do you think this is going to affect the price of our electricity? And will that make uh, companies easier to start and make them want to stay in the in, in Connecticut longer or go down south where energy because we have about we are in the top five states, probably the top three states in our cost of electricity of the entire country. Mm -hmm. And um, these are gonna increase our costs. And they may they will likely increase our costs, maybe more than the tolls would have. But this isn't a tax on us. It's just going to be electricity going up. Because if they have to pay it, 
um, they're going to go to the to the government and say we're going to have to charge more for electricity because you're making us pay this. So ultimately, it comes out of our pocket. So I'll give my perspective on it. Uh, my perspective on it uh, is it going to cost those businesses that are in the clean energy business more or less? Is it going to cost us more or less in terms of our rates? From my perspective, it looks like that remains to be uh, seen. Uh, you know, this is not particularly an initiative that I came up with uh, myself, but the folks and the proponents of this, and again, the budget is a bit of a compromise, felt that moving forward, that this would be the best way uh, for us to move forward to clean energy. Now, a lot of folks that are invested in clean energy businesses are not happy with this because you know, they started their business with a certain guideline and a certain, certain set of rules, right? <coughs> and now we're changing those rules, again, uh, midstream, and it's, it's a, a new way that hasn't been particularly proven uh, yet. But time will, uh, I think time will tell. I, I, in my opinion, and again, they may feel differently, I, don't, I, I just don't think anyone really knows for sure exactly how it's going to affect the, uh, the industry. And the idea here is to bring all our rates down. I'm waiting to see if it actually accomplishes that. So I mean, I'm, I'm not sure okay, what Jennifer you. Know, most you. The, um, you, we can choose our electric company now. Right. Right. And if we want, we can choose a company that uses this percent of, of renewable energy, this percent, or this percent, right. and you can see that it costs this much for the lowest percent, this much for the medium, right. and this much more for the most expensive. Right. So we know that the more renewable energy you use, the more expensive it's going to be. Yeah, right. And you know, it's great to say, well, eventually it's gonna come down. Let's let the big states make it come down because we're 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 a, we're the we are the third smallest state right. and whatever we do isn't going to really make any kind of a difference. Right. 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 No, again, we have to we'll have to see. This is uh, you know what was agreed upon in the bipartisan yeah. budget. It is definitely doing it a different way. I can I can certainly vouch that it is a different way. And whether it's going to make our situation better or worse, um, I think time okay. will. Uh, time um, another thing that I see in here is that we've now made more people eligible for the state insurance, mm -hmm. Medicaid, um, which Where which are you looking at the yeah, page? I, I'm not sure which I was. Medicare is so now, uh, wait a minute, let's see here. We, for a family of three, and I, I, I'm looking for this, we've raised it from like 20 some odd thousand dollars to 30 some odd thousand dollars. Page 15, Medicare Savings Program. Is that um, no. <laughs> Medicare cost savings for low income Medicaid, three separate tiers. Okay, so. Um, I certainly know with the healthcare, the notion was that we're trying to uh, shore up the healthcare benefits that we have in Connecticut uh, so that we would maintain them even if. Uh, Washington decides to do yeah, something, uh, do something differently, uh, and, and these are benefits that even be before the Affordable Care Act, many of these were in place here in uh, Connecticut, and we're, the idea was to try to uh, make sure that they are uh, maintained and in place, uh, even if uh, there are uh, cuts that are going to Washington. We're, we're making a commitment here in Connecticut uh, not to have a, a reduction in, in the quality. Because of if we thought we needed them, we wouldn't have been smart enough to choose to have those yeah. benefits in our insurance. But the other problem because is you guys know better. No, the other problem is the federal government makes us mandates us to to provide transitional coverage for people who have lost. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a decision made. I didn't make the decision, but there was a decision made that that may cost us more money in the long run because of those people that were not eligible. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's this whole, it's the problem with, you know, the, the overlap and the problems with Obamacare and, and how it affected Husky and, you know, how it, all the balls are in the air and which ones fell and which ones didn't and what we relied on and what actually happened and, and the transitional funding we have to pay for the people that were caught and that was part of that decision. So I, I to your, know, to your point, the point, yeah, that. right. The real point there is on the healthcare front side, it may actually cost the uh, the state more. But again, the decision by the legislature was made was that uh, you know, one director can to we don't want to have a, a significant or drastic reduction in the quality of healthcare that our residents are able to uh, uh, in Connecticut, whether they can afford it or whether they're of uh, challenged uh, income. So. That was a, that was the point. You're asking me the question. That's that's what that was about. Right. Okay. Because just be, you, you don't have to buy. We don't have to buy the minimum requirement. Right. So if 
for instance, I was uh, a single male and I needed to buy insurance, um, would I choose to buy insurance that gives me prenatal care, being that I would unlikely that I'd ever get pregnant. <laughs> right. um, but I have to pay for it anyway because it's one of those. Uh, you certainly make some good points, no question about it. Better I, right, I would just say the, right, the, the goal or the purpose of the change was just, and it really was more geared towards um, you know, not allowing <coughs> drastic uh, changes in, in uh, availability of health care, particularly for those uh, we can at least afford, uh, you know, a, a significant increase in cost of health care. Uh, so in that particular case, and I'm just explaining what I think what the intent of it was, and uh, but you make some very valid points uh, as well. And I'm certainly all ears for, for ideas and ways of fixing that those types of situations uh, in the future, for sure. And I think we can all agree the state of health care, whether it's at a state level or a federal level, is just a mess. Right, right. And right. that's the problem. So we, you know, a year ago, we cut those eligibility limits. That we made them less, and then in this budget they insisted on increasing them, and so we 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 make changes, and then the federal government puts you know responsibilities and mandates on us, and then we change them to try and fix that. So <clears throat> it's a game where I always feel like we're a step and a half behind because every day we're waiting to see what they're going to make us do and not do. So it's 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 by far perfect, and I can almost guarantee you that something will change with the next budget too. So I'm certainly not trying to portray it as being uh, perfect, and there definitely no. uh, many areas where it needs to be fixed. And you know, I'm uh, all ears, all ears, and uh, we'll do what we can to uh, you know, make our healthcare system here in uh, you know, Connecticut as uh, you know, effective as, as possible. But you make some very valid points there, for sure. Any you had something questions? back there. Your hand was up earlier. Did we answer your question? Well, I had a really a comment on the uh, proposal. Well, it wasn't really a proposal. I actually did it. Some of the towns that were fiscally conservative that had surpluses, yes. where they were going after the surpluses, not necessarily take the surpluses itself, but they did more drastic cuts to uh, have the towns that were more fiscally conservative. That was conservative. the governor. That wasn't, that wasn't the legislature. Well, I know. I know. We stopped I'm just saying from that. doing that. Right. It's, it's, it's offensive right. that we no, were working. Well, let, let me tell you something. Oh, you gotta start. No, but I'll, <laughs> let me say oh, this. Okay, so. Let's go back. I don't know if you were here when I told the story about how the budget was supposed to be done last April. No. Exactly. So every year, so this is how, how it works. This is just the, the, the schedule of how it works. So we get sworn in the first week of January. The first week, sec second week of February, the governor, whoever the governor is, does a budget proposal. So that's the beginning of the budget process. Then the Finance and the Appropriations Committee meets February, March, April, and they start working on a budget. So that's the legislative budget. And that is usually around April 30th that that's supposed to be presented and voted on in the Appropriations and Finance Committee. Last year that didn't happen. They didn't have a budget. We had nine budgets. So we kept pushing our budget to be voted on. And we're like, listen, vote, vote no if you want, but it should have a vote. Somebody has, you guys are in charge and you have no budget. I mean, we have nine budgets, so just vote on it. And if you don't like it, vote no, but somebody vote on something. So that was going on from the end of April, May, June, July, August, September, until we finally got a vote in September. But our fiscal year ended June 30th. So as of July 1st, we had no budget. And the way the stat state statute reads, mm -hmm. if there is no budget intact, the governor must run the state by executive order, month by month. And so they could do it monthly or he could do it quarterly, however. So nobody much cared in July, August, September until school started. Mm -hmm. All right, then they started to care in September, but not so much until that first ECS payment was going to be made, like the second or third week of October. And then everybody started panicking. When we were screaming and yelling all summer, everybody else is like having their summer and enjoying themselves. And we're like, you guys don't understand what's going to happen in October. You're not going to get that ECS payment. And there's going to be a big problem in every town in the state. So when that happened, what the governor did was he cut, so there's 169 cities and towns, obviously some are regional, but just give or take, you're dealing with that many, you know, that many budgets. He took, of those 169 cities and towns, he zeroed out 88 of them. Okay, so he gave them zero money in his executive order, and he cut between 22 and 66%, I think, 55 more. And that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And clearly, he did it with the towns, you know, who have, uh, um, more means, and I understand that, that 
there's an argument to be made. It's the, the, the wealthier you are, the more you can handle. I get it. I mean, I understand it, but that's not, he did it to punish because that's what he does. So in September, when we passed our budget and then he vetoed it, we had to make the decision. Do we sit in a room with our colleagues on the other side and the governor and try and figure out a way to fix this? And the main reason we did it was because if we did not sit down and have that conversation, those towns would have been zeroed out. And don't tell me that there's 88 towns in this state that can easily afford to get zero money for education funding. But and don't tell me that is, is a tax increase. Of course, the governor yes, of is course. causing the yep. local town right, every because town. someone yep. has to pay for it. If right. the state isn't paying for it, right. our property taxes. And then the 55 yep. other towns that were cut between 22 and 66. And then when you add to that, when you add to that the fact that he, you know, then was cutting those projects we talked about and all of that. You know, I, listen, he can, we could sit here for three days and discuss why he does what he does and why he doesn't. But it was, it was to be, to threaten. And he didn't like that he was no longer in the room doing this budget stuff with us. And he was for many months, but it just wasn't helpful anymore. And so that's why we decided to do that, because no matter what letter we have after our last name, our, our job is to make sure our towns are being taken care of. And when you're just spitefully cutting education of all things, you know, you, you can't have it. You can't have it. And that's what he was doing with it. And that's why we ended up sitting, sitting down. I mean, there were a lot of people that was like, no way, we're not going to negotiate, we're not going to get to go to the table. And we just said, listen, you have two choices here. I mean, you got to figure out who your enemy is. <coughs> right? And the enemy is not kids in the state. That's who we're here to help. And what's really aggravating is that it's not like uh, it's not like the, uh, uh, the governor that somehow his his uh, leadership team is somehow you know generating money through some investment or business uh, dealings, right? This is tax money, right? That all of the municipalities we are all sending up to Hartford, and to have the gall, the nerve to zero out so many communities after they have done their part to send money up to the state, and then to not distribute them in a fair and equitable way. It's just absolutely uh, rude. Okay. And then you add to that, last, so not this January, but the January before, the governor stood up there and he said in his budget address that he will not raise taxes, he will not add taxes. But what he did was, he said, I'm going to take $400 million of the teacher's pension, not, now remember, not the health care, but the teacher's pension, and put it on cities and towns and make them pay for it. Now, back to the, where does that come from? Obviously, property taxes. Right, so he's saying, I'm not going to raise your taxes, but he's also saying you got to figure out where to find $400 million somewhere, so your taxes will And be then that budget last year that I talked about that had the cell phone surcharge and the restaurant tax and all that stuff also had not $400, but $200 million for that, those teachers, that teacher's pension liability on cities and towns. You know, and that's why we sat there all summer, and that's why we didn't get a budget until October, and that's why we did nine budgets in our two caucuses, because we were not, I mean, listen, we were, we were going to go down fighting on that one, and we did, and we didn't, that didn't happen. Those towns didn't get those taxes, and we didn't get restaurant taxes and sales tax increases and all that stuff, and you got spending caps and bonding caps, and that's why we sat there. We said we want a vote on our budget. They were getting so desperate. They were even looking at, as you mentioned earlier, an additional cell phone usage tax. And then how about the tire tax? They were going to tax tires for crime. Additional tax on tires. I said, what? what in the world's so, going I mean, on? So I mean, we so, passed, we passed these, a few of these things that were important to us. We didn't get everything we wanted, but it, like we said, it took us a long time to get into this mess. Not necessarily our fault, but we want to be part of the solution. And if you don't take those steps to move us out of that, then we'll just continue down that, that wrong path. So Start going forward, three. what's the election look like? Are we gonna what are you vote? asking us? <laughs> I want the Democrats not to have control of anything because all they know how to do is tax and spend. Well, listen, we are obviously we're Republicans and we believe in what we believe in. We believe in our budgets and our proposals and that's uh, what we believe in. And so that, that's not a secret, but it's, it's you know, your guys' decision who you vote for. I want to see taxes cut. I want to see some relief. There's no business coming into this state unless Malloy throws money at him. There's almost a million square feet of, of Class A office space empty in Fairfield County. Mm -hmm. My clients have left. They're all gone. I can't earn a living here. I'm on the road 90% of the time. Is there any, is there any business going to come back into this state? 
it's doubtful unless they hand them a big tax abatement. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what's going what's to change that around. I remember two years ago uh, when GE made their big pronouncement that they were thinking of leaving. But, but, but let me just say this. When they make their big, their big pronouncement, they were thinking of leaving. Now, I know at that point they probably already decided they were leaving. But I went down to GE, and I got, was able to talk with the CFO. And I said to him, I'm just meeting you, and I don't mean to be rude, but where have you guys been for the past 10 years when all this was happening? Okay, I understand business wants to make sure that they cover all their bases and they don't want to get involved in politics and they, they have to run their businesses, which I get, but you also run a business in a state that's pushing bad policies and bad, you know, whether it's tax policy, fiscal policy, transportation I, I policy, but if at them every single day, you need to get involved. If you don't like what's going on, you have to tell the people in charge you don't like it. You can't complain when it's over, right, and you've decided to leave. And he said, he said to me, and, and I'll tell you, in the past year, we've gotten a lot of uh, business people, like large business people involved. And, if, and we have put, actually put together um, a commission this past year when we were doing our budget called the Fiscal Accountability Commission that came out with a lot of good recommendations and some of them we put into uh, this budget. He said one thing to me. He said, Themis, and that was right the month after we, that budget was passed that we didn't vote for, but that had the highest tax increase in the state's history, every anti-business bill known to man, and every regulation you could find in it. He said, if you could snap your fingers and change it, like erase it, make believe it didn't happen, it would not materially affect whether we stay or we go, because we do not trust the vision of the leadership of the state of Connecticut, meaning if you don't do it today, they're going to do it next week, or six months from now, or next year. And that's the issue. It's the vision of leadership. And the vision of our leadership now is not good. Right. And that's what needs to change. It's not about this, let's put in told you so we can grab money and then we'll figure out the policy later. It's not let's make pot legal whether you agree with it or not. That's a philosophical conversation, but not just so we can get money in. Well, and that's exactly You know what I mean? These things hunt. have law, these are, it's, they're huge public health initiatives. They're, they're public safety initiatives. You know, they're fiscal initiatives. They're transportation initiatives. They're big deals. You don't just change them because you want money. Absolutely. And that's the vision, right? That's what has and to change. And that's my biggest fear. And this is right. why, and I'm, why you I, have I don't to, know whether I can stay. You can in, stay, in but state. you can stay because you're gonna. We can elect like-minded people. Right. Well. And I can't make that happen. I can only put the message out. There. <clears> right. But, you but, guys can make that but what's against this is every big city in this state that that wants that <laughs> wants. That mm -hmm. wants the Democrats to stay in control so they can sit back and get, and get all right, their pennies. We need to get everybody else up to vote. Yep, right? The big cities can vote, but I've, everybody else needs to vote. I've heard estimates that between 55 and 80 people net leave this state every day. Absolutely. And I'll be one of them. The people leaving the state make an average of $125,000. The people coming into yes. the state, because they're not all leaving, I said a net, the people coming into the state yeah, make an average of $60,000. So our tax base is exiting You're right. the You're state. Right. And it we've started going negative. The, we, we, we passed a, um, a tax increase in 11, and in 12 is the first year that it started mm -hmm. going negative. Is that the reason? I don't know. I've already pointed out three things. But it's the vision, though. Uh, that's I, know, I know. I agree I've, with already, I've already pointed out three things in here that are going to increase the cost to both individuals and businesses between uh, between energy and um, and uh, and insurance. Um, there's this thing called a state sales tax nexus where the state's going to end up with more money from it, and people who do this kind of work will not operate in this state. They'll operate in another state, so they don't have to have the nexus in this state, because every other state isn't doing it, and we're the third smallest state, so why be here? But also remember, we also now have a spending cap, a bonding cap, a volatility cap, things that we haven't had in a million years. In, in 1992, when you all went to vote on a referendum question, do you want a spending cap in the state of Connecticut? And it's overwhelmingly yes, I think in 80%. Okay, but, but, but next but year, it, you're, but, you're gonna debate the um, you're going to debate the tolls again, and businesses aren't going to start because they because of the vision. We're talking vision again. Right. You're going to debate the paid changes. leave, and Not because the of the vision, changes. Right. Businesses aren't going to start. But that's why leadership okay. has to change. And, that's and, you're, point and, and you're going to debate raising the uh, the raising the minimum wage mm -hmm. to fifteen dollars or more, even though the people in the legislature know it's never going to pass. 
That's the vision. Not if the leadership changes, because remember, the, the leadership of the House and the Senate, okay, let's just put the governor aside for a second, because governor has a lot of control, but it all stops in the, with the legislature, because he can veto anything he wants, and we can override anything we want, and that's it. it's over with. And that's what happened this year. That's why so many things changed for the first time in years. So the Speaker of the House and the Senate President decides what's called the end. Nothing's called unless those two people, so nothing's even debated right. until those two people yes. allow those things to be debated. That's why need to change leadership. And that's why, and that's, those things won't get called. You can't change the vision until you change the leadership. Right? right? So, I mean, listen, you know what my answer is. I don't know. But the answer's answer got to be, you know, people right. come out and vote for the people that they believe are putting, you know, that kind of thing in the right direction. I will tell you that, you know, in that spending cap thing, um, that was 1992. But in that directive, when you guys voted for that, it said, but it must go back to the legislature to actually define it. It's 2018. Every year we put in legislation we have to define it and put it through. And another one of my colleagues, a leader on the other side of the aisle, who I like very much, we just don't agree philosophically, said to me, well, thanks, so why do we want to do that? That ties our hands. This was like three years ago when we were debating. I go, that's the point, because clearly you can't tie your own hands. <laughs> so I understand your point, and there's certainly no perfect budget, and there's a budget that I can write, and I would find things that I don't like about it, because it's thousands of pages. But the things that were good far outweigh the things that were bad, and that's come from us in the minority. Okay, so imagine so if you the, were the if you were the majority leader, what Speaker. three things could you cut in the budget? To save us, to save the government some money. Well, I would. I. Oops. I don't think you can go to three things. I think I will first say to you before I get to the things that I would look at. Is no, no any let's, just, let's, let's just say. No, okay, let me just start. Let me. I want to take two steps back because I, I, I kind of have a, a strong feeling about this. First of all, there's no such, I don't care who's in charge, and I don't care how much they're in charge by, unless you have a veto-proof majority, which we actually did many years ago. They did. There's always going to be things that we don't like in a budget, because there's a lot of people from a lot of different places and a lot of people voting on it. But I have said from the beginning, you know, when I was thinking of running for governor, I said the first thing I would do is bring every agency head into my office. And, and, and not this whole, this is, you're getting X amount of dollars this year, tell me why you, don't, you deserve more. I would tell you to start from zero and tell me why you need everything you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think it's got to come from, from it's got to be in conjunction with the governor and the legislature. I think that there's a lot of waste in every single agency. So it's not even like there's three things I would pick. I think there's a ton of things you could find. I mean, George mentioned some, there's actually, he said old age care or something. There's actually a line in the budget that says old age care. That's actually a thing, like a, a, like a technical name. And then, and then you can find 10 other lines, which is elderly and this and this and this. Now, that's a priority of ours, obviously, but I think that a lot of that stuff can be consolidated. I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people that could need our, our help that don't know about programs. I think there are a lot of programs that are being wasted that, that we could use that money for. I think we could add money to other programs and still have a net you know, gain of money we get back. I think there's just a lot of waste in all of it. I think this whole notion, I mean, we have agency heads that literally come to us in this appropriations um, process I was telling you about. There's subcommittees and there's, you know, um, like the judicial branch and then there's the mental health branch and, you know, social services and they all come before the little committees of the appropriations committee. And they actually can think they're being, cut, they're being cut if you don't give them more. Like that, that's how, how, much it's, how bad it's gotten. Right? You gotta start at zero. I think every year you gotta start, every time you do a budget, you start at zero again. Tell me why you need that money that you're getting and tell me how you used it. Now we're just putting out a release tomorrow. We have these state auditors that audit all these agencies every year. 57% of every you know, problem that these state auditors find in every agency never get resolved. 57%, it's coming out of my office tomorrow and many wow. others, 57%. Just imagine that, right? The inefficiencies from right. all I've, I've, I've got a suggestion. Okay. How many people here pay per minute when they call Hartford? From their telephone, from your cell phone, or from your home phone? No. 
If you don't, well, why do they have 800 numbers then? There are no there are no payphone CUs anymore. Right. That's the only place I can think of mm -hmm. that you need one. I would look into that. I needed to call. That's write that down. I needed to call. I needed to call the uh, Department of uh, uh, Consumer Protection about a licensing issue, and the only number I can find is an 800 number. I usually just choose the one if they gave both. I choose yep. the other one, but so for a year you'd have to have a message saying we've changed our number. This is our new one, and then a year from now, boom, all the 800 numbers turn off, and you stop paying per I'm minute for that. incoming mm -hmm. calls because we're not paying anything per minute for outgoing calls anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. You're right. Good. Yeah, good point. Does, does the does the controller track loss of revenue due to tax increases and people leaving? I gotta believe that. That the people, the producers in this state are getting smaller and smaller, and they're leaving, so there's less taxable revenue. Well, I'll tell you what the Department of Revenue Services has done has done in the past year, two years, which they've never done before, is they're actually tracking the top 100 taxpayers in the state of Connecticut, private taxpayers, because it has gotten so bad, and those top 100 or 200 taxpayers pay such a, a large percentage of the entire state tax income tax. That if one leaves, we're in big trouble. Well, I know that for a fact because but that's a new the thing. People in the past I work years. for are people that are in financial services. They own hedge funds, and so they packed up and left. They're gone. They're because out of they this can. state. Right. You know, I'll tell a quick story. What I took last election, so last October, two Octobers ago, um, the state realtors kind of did by by county legislative breakfasts. And they did Middlesex and New Haven County. Did you go to that as a candidate? Uh, no. no. They did Middlesex and New Haven County together. And it was so they had so many people there for the first time that they had to have it at Woodwinds in Brantford. There was like 350 realtors there. Mm -hmm. But because Middlesex and New Haven County, there were so many legislators, there were probably 15 of us. Republicans, Democrats, House, Senate. And at one point, when it got to the, the audience asking questions, now let's remember, this is realtors. So they actually know who's coming in and mm -hmm. moving out. And they're not dentists, right? I mean, they're realtors. So one woman stood up. I mean, similar question, things that we're talking about. You know, you know how many people are leaving, and what are you going to do about it, whatever. And the chairman of the appropriations committee stood up and said the following. Listen, I know people are leaving, but more people are coming in, so we're fine. There's not a problem. I have never been to a legislative breakfast where people, somebody's gotten booed before. Like booed to the, and then, and then this is terrible, but her car got keyed. Her car got keyed. Uh -huh. Which is a terrible thing. But my point is, that is how delusional some of my colleagues are. To actually say, and to your point, right, the people that are leaving, are, their income levels are higher than people are coming in, but it's still a net loss. Right. You know, it's not still not even. Right. Okay? And, and so to say that, think about saying that. Think about you are the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and you're actually saying that to people that do see who's coming in and coming out every day. So that's the problem. I mean, they're delusional because they don't want to make the tough decisions, and that's what we've been able to do, and we're proud of that, and that's why we believe our vision is better. Who's going to buy the million dollar houses in Fairfield County? When the when the hedge funds are leaving, right. who are they going to sell the house to? Well, that is. means it's either going to get foreclosed on, or it, or someone's going to take a huge loss. It, and even it boils down to I've been in my house 22 years, and I have ne virtually negative appreciation on my house. I mean, I'm going to sell and basically break even, <laughs> and and, then, and I'm paying higher property taxes every year. What sense does that make? Makes no sense. I Why? Will report that People aren't coming in. People aren't moving in here. <laughs> well, uh, t t Tony Anastasio keeps pointing out that um, in, in our town we have uh, gold balloons that, we, that people who are graduating get, and yeah. the gold balloons go down and the for sale signs go up because the gold balloons mean that they're, they're graduating. Right. They're out. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. And uh, just for your earlier question, when you asked, uh, you know, which three items would I cut out my priority? Yes. I've uh, told folks uh, my goal, my objective would be, if uh, I was in that uh, position, to not raise anyone's taxes at all and force us to work within our means to start. 
once we do that for a little while, and that would force all different That's ages of departments. Idea. The, the ages. I know, right? It's once crazy. and then once you do that, then you look at where it makes the most sense to you know notch taxes back a little bit, whether it's the sales tax or the income tax. But first, to me, it's complete folly and fantasy to think that there you can make any kinds of major tax cuts that are meaningful without first being able to just to being able to just stop raising taxes. Correct. So that is my main goal, is just stop raising taxes. I, I think that would help in terms of bringing predictability and stability that the business community is looking for. I think that will force our government to work more effectively and efficiently because they know that the dollars that are coming to their agencies are not increasing. And we need to force these agencies to be more effective, to be more, to be, do more blueprinting in terms of what is their you know, mission, what is their goal, what are they trying to achieve, and blueprint that out. Look at process flow. Figure out a way to do, uh, you know, to do more uh, with uh, with less. I think we just have to stop raising uh, taxes to start, and then we can see the benefits of those kicking in. And then when we see improvements, we start uh, strategically notching back. Uh, areas where we can in terms of both taxes. But and again, to George and Themis's point, it's it, all these departments, Themis talked about starting from zero, but the inefficiencies that these departments all have, the, the, the fraud, you know, in all these different departments, if we could fix even half of those, the millions upon millions of dollars we would save right there would help, you know, the state of Connecticut. And that's part of the problem too. We know, I mean, we could talk about DMV for hours with the problems of DMV. But well, the first thing I would do is pri privatize that. Right. And it's the first thing I would do. Right, yeah. you know, that's, that's something that's very important. Like, just like we do. Yeah. If you're not yeah. efficient, what happens yeah. in your job? You get fired. Right. You know, because here's the reality. I don't care if you're GE or you own the coffee shop on the corner with one employee. You're, that's what business drives the state. That's what businesses drive the state. And you, you have the same struggles, just at different levels. But it's all relative to the money you're making the money you're investing. Gotcha. And if you don't have, if you don't believe that the vision of leadership of this state is going to make you make your life predictable, then why would you stay? Here? Right. And that's our job to make sure that you know what you're getting. And a lot of the you know, believing are younger people mm -hmm. in their twenties um, who've been educated in this state. Yeah. We've actually paid for education. <laughs> we have five children. Four of them have already moved out of state. We're very happy. They're taxpayers in other states. We have one, he wants to, he wants to leave as soon as he can. Because of them, we're going to end up one day leaving because we'll follow our children. Right. Right. So that's right. one family in Woodbridge of seven people gone. Well, and that's, our, all that's our job taxpayers. to make you stay here. Because mm -hmm. you know what, somebody, I was, we had office hours, gosh, like, Two years, almost a year and a half ago now, right after the election, and there was a fellow there. He was probably in his mid twenties, and he was reading from a script. So I don't know which group he was part of, but he, you know, he, he was one of those things where, which we got the first those first couple months, everybody asking the same questions all over the state, and why don't you support this? Do you support that? I said, listen, I support everything you just said, but supporting it and understanding if we have the money to pay for are two different things. And back to the five billion dollar deficit at the time, prioritizing you know, elderly and children, disabled population, that kind of thing. Th those are the decisions. I don't have the luxury, we don't have the luxury of just saying, yes, I think that's a good idea, let's do it, because I have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. And figure out how we're going to pay for it means how you're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I said, sir, do you, have, do you have a home? Do you have a job? And he goes, yes. I said, well, I assume you need that job to pay for your rent or pay your mortgage and you know, pay for your family you've had, whether it's your health care, your utilities, your food, you know, the things that everybody has to pay for every day. He goes, yes. I go, I look at my job as a legislator, it's to figure out a way to make sure you have a job so you can support yourself and your family. So when your family, you know, when you have kids and they leave, they want to come back here because they can, they can get a job. And if they get a job, then they can afford a home. And then you can afford to retire here. And you, your families can stay together. We can afford to stay here. That's our job, to put together laws and budgets and policies to make sure that that stuff works. And it hasn't been working under the leadership and the vision we've seen, because that's why people, or they wouldn't be leaving. So. I have one embarrassing question. Oh, no. 
Embarrassing for you or for me? For you. Oh, oh boy. Well, just putting you on the spot. Why aren't you running for governor? We had this question. That was our main question when we came tonight. <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, it was a. I, I thought about it long and hard for a long time and tortured everybody around me in that yes. thinking. Yep, I did. But it came down to what I said before. As important as I believe having um, being a governor is, I think having <coughs> a legislature who has the last word is more important for me right now because if we're going to make a change in the state, I mean, listen, we had Republican governors for 20 years, but we have, we've had Democrat-controlled House and Senate for over 40 years. Exactly. Okay, and so at the end of the day, everybody's got to work together or this isn't going to work, mm -hmm. but we go back to that vision. And if you don't have that vision, and the legislature has not had the vision, and so I was very honored that I had that choice to make, whether I want to try and, you know, bring the House into the majority or try and run for governor, but at the at that end of that thought process, I had to pick one, because I couldn't do both, um, and I wasn't going to do neither. So I made the decision that getting majority in the House and working towards that is going to change the vision of this state more than, than running for governor. Is, it, is there anything positive that came out of the experience that happened last year? Do you think that it brought- You mean the budget the, experience? The budget experience, mm -hmm. it brought people together in any positive way to think about the future? I mean, a lot of the issues are gonna, you know, the deficits, like a lot of that's gonna persist. And, you know, I think, every, I think that you've definitely voiced some good points to work into the right direction. But do you think that that experience had, there's anything positive that came out of that? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I think. And then I don't, I think it's pretty accurate. When you have over 40 years of one party control in, in, in a whole legislature, the House and the Senate, and now remember, in all those years, there was one term in the House in the 80s, and there was one term in the Senate in the 90s where there was Republican control. The rest of the time, it was Democrat control. And not their fault. I've talked to my colleagues about this. Um, that's why the Speaker and the Majority Leader have had such a difficult time. And, and we're friends. We don't agree policy-wise, but we get along fine. Because that's all they know. All they know is we're in control, we're in the majority by a lot of numbers. I mean, when the governor first got elected in 2010, there were 114 Democrats in the House of 151. That was a veto-proof number. I mean, you couldn't over, they could override on their own, right? And so the philosophy and the mentality was such that, listen, we're in the majority, been in the majority for 40 years, we can kind of do what we want. We're going to let the Republicans in, that's fine, but we don't really care what they have to say, and we're just going to do what we want. And that's how it's been. Not because they're bad people, because that's what they knew. And all of a sudden, in the past four elections, we won 35 seats in the House. 35 seats with every Republican above us losing governor, president, U.S. Senate, Congress. So I think what last year showed is you can't do it that way anymore. Remember, in the House, a simple majority is 76. The Democrats now have 79, which means technically they could pass anything they want, right? Couldn't get a budget passed. They could not get a budget passed on any given day last year, or this year, by the way, without sitting down and having a real conversation about the fact that there are people that represent 50% of the people of the state. And it would do you well to figure out a way to do this together. And so I think, I think it did. You know, I think it, it did, people did learn a lot from it because I think it was a rude awakening. I mean, for us, we dig it out every day. I mean, the entire time we've been in office, we've been in the minority, so we grind it out, we fight it out, we believe in our policies and our vision, and we get knocked down because we don't have enough people. And then all of a sudden, the past two years, that has changed. And so we've been able, I mean, to, a minority party passing a budget is unheard of. So I think that for us, it was, it was enabling, but for them, I think they realized that it's not the same old, same old anymore, and it, you get a lot more done if you try and do it together. So I'm going to keep that hope, mm -hmm. and um, hope that doesn't change. It, because it, if it, we're in the majority, I'll tell you I will always make sure that they're in the room. That doesn't mean we agree on everything. Just like in this, I mean, there are things in that that I could, there's 10 other things I could tell you I don't like, but there's a lot that, that got done would have never happened if we, these numbers weren't this close. And it's a big difference for the state. It's time for one more question as we got to Yeah, and if I could just mention majority. as well, when you particularly look at the House, where they have the numbers, right? 79 Democrats and how many uh, Republicans? 71. Are, and 71 Republicans. But the issue here, it is a matter of leadership, right? Because now when you're looking at, when, the, when you have you know, closer to the parity there, 
there are a number on both sides of the aisle that have uh, common views on certain areas. One, you can find Democrats that are more fiscally conservative, and they're not going to put up with a ridiculous uh, budget that's you know that's out there, right? And so they're not going to look as much you know on both sides in terms of. Of, uh, of party is more in terms of what's right for the state of Connecticut. And that's where we're talking about leadership. We need individuals, people, right, that are of like mind, that are interested in moving the state in the right direction, right? And that's why I urge and encourage individuals, to, uh, uh, voters, to look at the individuals, look at what they stand for, regardless of what their uh, party affiliation is. What are they going to do when they're in there? You know, are they going to continue? more on the, on the path that we have been in, which is increasing taxes and uncontrollable uh, spending, or are we going to rein that in?